My out-of-studio partner for today's program is Mike Gendron. Mike, welcome back. Thanks for having me, Tom. For maybe a new listeners to the program, we've been going through the book of Romans, Paul's epistle to the Romans, and we're in chapter 3. But, Mike, in this program, as you well know, in terms of going through the scriptures, we started out with Galatians and the natural follow-up to the book of Galatians, in which Paul was greatly concerned for those who he had led to Christ— these he would consider his spiritual children, those who he preached the gospel to them, they received the gospel, but then they were turning to another gospel, as it says in the book of Galatians. But in Romans, he lays out what this gospel is, and it's absolutely tremendous. If you've not read the Bible before, our encouragement is to read the Bible. Begin with the gospel of John that lays out so much information that it's uh, so important with regard to salvation. But then in terms of doctrine, in terms of the teaching, in terms of the explanation of what the gospel is about, Romans, right, Mike? That's right. So we're in Romans chapter 3. We're going to pick up with verse 25. We read it last week, but I think it's important to go back over it. Verse 25, whom God has set forth, speaking of Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Now, some terms here may be a little foreign to some of our listeners. Propitiation. What that simply means is Jesus paid the penalty that God's justice demanded. He became the sacrifice for us, the substitute. Mike, I believe you used that term last week. The substitute, our substitute, So we'll talk about that in a second. But now the next term, through faith, that's how we appropriate what Christ has done for us. It's by faith. We put our trust in him. And then when it says in his blood, that's the reference that he died upon the cross. God became a man because he became our substitute. He became the sacrifice that was in our place. So in order to do that, he had to become a man and he had to die upon the cross. Now, there's more to it than that, but at least to understand his blood, when that term is used through Scripture, it's talking about his death on the cross. To declare his righteousness. God's righteousness, as we mentioned in verse 22, is what he has done for us. God, one of his characteristics we talked about is holiness, certainly righteousness, mercy, love, all of these things Christ accomplished through obedience to the Father, paying the full penalty for our sin, and all this encompasses his righteousness. He wasn't a sinner, but we are under condemnation for our sin. But he took our place for the remission of sins. It's the only way sins are taken away. What do you think, Mike? Tom, that brings up a good point on what propitiation and remission accomplish. You know, it goes back to the great day of atonement. There was always two goats. The high priest presented two goats. One was slain and its blood was brought into the tabernacle and its blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat, a covering for the sins. But then the other goat was called the scapegoat and the sins of all the people were laid on the scapegoat and he was led out into the wilderness as an expiation of the sins. And so we see the two forms here, not only the covering of the sin through the shed blood, but also the taking away of the sin. And this is important because one of the attributes that we've talked about, God's holiness, is such that his attribute does not allow sin in his presence. He Mm -hmm. cannot look upon sin. So the sin not only needs to be forgiven, but it also must be taken away. And so this is why we see Christ as a picture of both of these goats in the great day of atonement. Yeah, and that's an important point, Mike. Maybe some of our listeners who have tried to read through the Old Testament, read bits and pieces here and there, and are confused by the sacrificial system that's laid out. To help you understand that, all these things, the Scripture calls them a shadow of the things to come. And as you 
said Mike, these are a picture of what was going to take place down the line. You could go back to really to the Garden of Eden in Genesis after Adam and Eve sinned. You have God covering them with the skins of animals. Mm -hmm. And the indication there is that Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves with fig leaves, all right? But that's man's idea. Man comes up with all kinds of ways to cover their sins and so on, but it doesn't work. It says in Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So from Genesis on, from the sacrifice of Abel to the Passover lamb, to Abraham bringing Isaac to the mountainside to really sacrifice Isaac, which God prevented him from, all of these things were pictures, were types to point to what Jesus would accomplish on the cross. As a matter of fact, there's hardly anything in the Old Testament that doesn't in some way or shape or form point to Jesus Christ and what he would accomplish. It's so true, Tom. And so often we hear people talk about the love of God, and surely God would not send anyone to hell for eternal torment and punishment. But they don't understand the holiness of God. If divine wrath fell not upon Jesus Christ, it must fall upon us because God cannot let sin pass. And so this is where we get the picture of the substitution. Tom, as a Catholic, I always knew that Jesus died for the sins of the world, but I never knew why. Mm -hmm. I never knew it was to satisfy God's holiness and justice. And so once I recognized that the wages of sin is death and that Christ died on the cross, he did it for me. That was my substitute. That's when the gospel became clear to me. And since then, I've realized that Christ dying on the cross for the sins of the world, that's history. But Christ dying on the cross for me, that's salvation. And there's a difference that Catholics really need to know, because every Catholic knows the historical part, but they have not trusted Christ as their substitute. And their church teaches, and this is one thing that, Mike, you growing up Roman Catholic, and I grew up Roman Catholic, in terms of a lack of understanding— One of the things that was promoted, both directly and indirectly, explicitly and implied, was that Christ didn't pay the full penalty. (laughs) That's why we needed the Mass. That's why we needed suffering on our own part to expiate our own sins, which we were taught over and over again, as though anything we could do would complete what Christ couldn't do. Mike, that's blasphemy. It's not just absurd. It's just ludicrous. Well, and it's impossible. If an right. eternal God cannot cancel an infinite debt, but leaves a little bit for us to pay, it still remains to be an infinite debt. Because unless you wipe out an infinite debt, there will always be an infinite debt that remains. Exactly. You can't partition infinity, okay? You, no, you 1% can't... of infinity is still infinity. Exactly. But I didn't understand that, Mike. You didn't understand it because we were never taught, although the Scriptures laid out very clearly, he paid a ransom, the Scripture talks about. Well, you don't pay a partial ransom. No one's going to be set free on that basis. The full ransom had to be paid. He did it all. From the cross, Christ cried out to tell us that. In the Greek, it means it is finished, paid in full. That's what I had to come to understand, that there was nothing that I could do. But the good news was that he did it all completely. And that's what you would expect. If God is going to become a man to pay the penalty for our sins, to redeem us, to become our, as it says here, our expiation, our substitute, he's not going to do it partially. This is not the way God does things. Well, Tom and Catholics need to know, too, if they try and mix their good works with the finished work of Jesus Christ, all it does is produce divine indignation. Because what it does is it diminishes what it costs God to save sinners. It diminishes what it costs Christ to take away our sins. And it takes away the honor that the Father gives to the Son for being obedient unto death. And it also diminishes the glory that is reserved for Christ alone Mm -hmm. as the Redeemer of all of us who have been enslaved to sin. And so it just, it's horrible for Catholics to think that they can throw in their two cents worth and help what Jesus accomplished on Calvary's cross. Mike, good point. Two cents worth. It's like somebody coming to your door 
A friend of mine likes to use this example. Somebody coming to your door and they present you with a Rembrandt. It's worth millions and millions of dollars. And you, in trying to be uh, thankful or whatever, you give them $5 for it. (laughs) What an insult. (laughs) It's terrible. But it's even worse than that because it's a rejection. It's Mm -hmm. saying, no, Jesus did not pay the full penalty. I have to do something on my own, which, as you said, it's impossible. There's nothing you can do. Isaiah wrote that even our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. There's nothing we can bring to it, but we don't have to. All we have to do is put our trust our complete trust in him, knowing who Jesus is, knowing what he did for us, and putting our faith and our trust in him. And Tom, the ultimate purpose of Christ dying for us was to bring him glory. Right. And so if we try and add anything to that, we're really taking away from the glory that he so richly deserves. And I just wish Catholics knew that. I wish they could see that Once they recognize Christ is sufficient, that he accomplished everything that was necessary, then they will want to sing his praises and give him honor and glory for all eternity. Mike, again, as we mentioned last week, we didn't mention this week, but we don't want people going on just what we say. The program is called According to God's Word. We want to encourage everyone to check out what we say. Go to the Scriptures. Look, the Bible, if you can read Greek, that's great. If you can read Hebrew, that's great. But you don't have to. There are many translations. You know, Catholic Bible, go to your Catholic Bible. And one place that I would recommend that you go is Ephesians chapter 2 and read verse 8, 9, and 10. Now, again, Mike, you didn't make this up. I didn't make it up. But here's what it says. For by grace... Are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves? It is the gift of God. What great news! It's by grace, through faith, and it's a gift. But, Mike, as you mentioned, I'll pick up with verse 9 not of works, lest any man should boast. You want to grab off, try to grab off some of God's glory? Well, you can't do it, number one, but if you try, you are rejecting what he has given you what he has provided for you. Now, what about works? Do works play any part? Yes, they do. Look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. You can't do one good work unless you know Christ, unless you've accepted him. And you do that also by faith. So God has prepared for us. It says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God's got plenty for us to do. But if you think you can earn one inch of eternal life, inch is not the right term, but if you can earn anything with regard to eternal life through your works, forget it. God has provided for it, and you have to simply receive it. Another way to say it, Tom, is you don't have the power to do good works until you're born again, until you're born of the Spirit of God, because it's the Spirit's power that enables you to do the works that God has prepared in advance for you to walk in. And those works will glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. They will not bring self-glory. They will be done in faith and not in the flesh. And so those are some of the marks of good works. But as you have pointed out, you must first be justified. You must first be a child of God before your works will count for anything. And only then they will count for rewards in heaven. But you know what's neat is we give the rewards right back to the rightful owner. That's the Lord Jesus yeah. Christ, because it's he living through us that accomplished the work. Right. There's a temporal benefit. I think of the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears, dried his feet with her hair. And this is what Jesus said. This is her motivation. Jesus said, she loves much because she was forgiven much. Once we have received Christ's forgiveness, then what we do is all to his glory. And we know the love of Christ that only knowing him can provide. Amen. Please visit our website, thebereancall.org, to access our radio archives going back to 1999 and our newsletter going back to 1986. 
We offer daily updates by email or visit us on Facebook or Twitter. Are you looking for information about a specific topic? Go to the BereanCall.org and click on Topics at the top of the page. Our online store is thebereancall.com. We offer a wide variety of books, tracks, CDs, and DVDs. Note that most of our ebooks are free. I'm Gary Carmichael. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you can join us again next week. Until then, we encourage you to search the scriptures 24 7. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back.